Welcome into the Wrestling Legends Podcast. I am your host, once again here, Vince McKee, and you are listening to Keon Sports. Today we sit outside the beautiful outside studios here at Keon Sports. We've opened up the summer with quite a few outstanding interviews from Mr. Kennedy to Dory Funk Jr. Uh, today, Missy Hyatt. A few weeks ago, we had Ahmed Johnson. And on and on down the line, it's been an incredible start to Season 4 of the Wrestling of Legends podcast. Without any further ado, let's bring her on the phone now, Missy Hyatt. All right, on the show today with us, Missy Hyatt, uh, really a trailblazer in the field of women's professional wrestling. And uh, we're honored to have her on the show today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. You're actually trailblazing some ground today, and I say that because... We've had over probably 75 professional wrestlers since we started doing this uh, Wrestling of Legends podcast a few years back, but you are only the third female to, to come on the show. We had Alundra Blaze, and we had Terry Runnels, so this is actually some pretty high regard, and we're glad to have you. Oh, well, thank you, and I'm in good company because I like both of those ladies a lot. I call Alundra Blaze or Medusa my sister wife, so... Oh, that's great. Yeah, she's yeah. tremendous. She's tremendous, and I actually have a question about her later on here. But I wanted I wanted to start off with this because, you know, uh, the beginning of your career, you know, quite a bit of it in the beginning there was spent in Texas for you know WCCW out of Texas. What was it like wrestling and and being on that promotion with so many legends and around a guy like Fritz von Eric and really the passion of the Texas fans? Oh my gosh, it was so totally amazing. You have to imagine this is back in the olden days when people would actually pay every week, you know, every Friday night to come to the Sportatorium, and every Monday night at the, um, I forget the arena's name in Fort Worth, or the Cow, Cow Palace, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But they would, you know, they'd actually leave their house and come to a show and pay money for the show. I mean, the fans were dedicated. They were dedicated, and they were the best. And I had a blast there. If I could go back in time to any period of my life, I would go back to world-class wrestling. You know, how great it was. One of the things that I think that really drew fans to you, outside of just your look, and I mean, we're, we'll get to that in a bit. Yes, you are a beautiful woman, but w you. you're very welcome. But <laughs> was was really, truly, you know, when you had those opportunities to speak and be on the microphone and, and do Missy's Manor, it really, I think, brought the fans out, kind of showed, you know, you could do both, maybe a hill, maybe a face. You could speak with anybody. And I wanted to ask you about this because there's a story out there um, you know, maybe it's an urban legend or maybe it really happened. I, I want you to clear this up about Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. When he was going to leave for a bit, the WWF to try Hollywood, they said that you were supposed to come in and take his spot for the Piper's pit and call it Missy's Manor. Is that yes. true? Can you, can you tell us all about that? Positive. Yes, that's true. And, um, I had the opportunity. I went up there. They had a beautiful set made for me and, um, they had me interview and they were just horrible interviews. They were horrible. They got, you know, Vince had everything. It was kind of, um, scripted and he wanted me to be more of a face. And when I went out there, I just, I bombed. I couldn't do it. I had never interviewed anybody. I remember asking Jimmy Hart a question. And I didn't give him the microphone. Yeah, I didn't put it under his mouth or whatever. And he had to kind of grab my hand and, and put it over to him because I had never interviewed anybody before. And, and you can look at my segments. They're on YouTube. They're really horrible, though. I mean, I cringe when I watch them. I'm like, oh, my God, they're so bad. But I had an opportunity in WWE, and I bombed. So, But I was supposed to take over Piper's Pit, and that's really hard. You know, how do you take over somebody who's fantastic you know how do you fill their shoes very hard to do no it's a tough task for anybody and to make you feel a little bit better you know eric bischoff years later had the same problem he had like a spot interview out of nowhere with vince mcmahon they made him talk to a broom or something crazy like that and it just you know sometimes you're on that spot those things happen we've been interviewing like i said we've been interviewing pro athletes for years here on the show and every now and then you, you get that, uh, you know, kind of that choked up moment. So I totally understand that. Um, yeah. You know, but later on you were with WCW. And to me, in, in, in my retrospect as, you know, being 41 years old, that's truly uh, where I first remember you. Okay. So, in, you know, oh, okay. 
in WCW, Jim Crockett, promotions, NWA, all that good stuff wrapped into one. One of the biggest feuds you had while you were there was with a guy named Paul Heyman. You know, what yes. <laughs> instant last, right? So basically, you know, what was it like working with Polly? Polly Dangerous at oh the time. Oh my gosh, it was so fun. But what was really bad is that he used to co host a show that was just out of New York area and he used to blast me on that show and say so much bad stuff about me. It was really fun. I never got the opportunity to give him a receipt. You know, to to do my own, you know, blasting on him. But he was really great to work with. He's so creative. He comes up, his facial expressions, just everything about him is so fun to work with. I mean, one time though in Tallahassee, he used to, I, we were doing the mixed tags around everywhere. And um, I was working with PN News sometimes, sometimes the Steiners, you know, just different people. But when I'd work with PN News, he'd come out and do a rap and end up calling me, in the rap, calling me a whore. And um, I was like, listen, my dad's here tonight with my nephew and some friends and stuff like that. Please don't do your rap. He did it anyway. So at the end of the match, when I come in to tag him, I kicked him so hard. (laughs) And I laid over for the tag. I was like, that's your receipt, you know. (laughs) Yeah, because he did. It. He was so funny that I really love Paul. You know, it's funny too because I'm going to go off script here for a second with one of my one, one of my questions because I wasn't going to bring up a ton of WCW cheese as I call it. You know, like some yeah. of the the Jim Hurd corniness, but oh you know, P- PN News was one of those dudes where it was like, how are we supposed to get behind this guy? I mean, I'm not being mean, but he was just some big fat guy and he looked like a kid, oh, right? Yeah, right. And he was Samoan, you yeah. know? I mean, how's he a rap? I mean, I guess there's Samoan rappers, but I don't know any, but, right. you know. Samoan heritage, you have, you know, you have the Samoan SWAT team, and often Sika, you have such a great heritage, and then this comes out, and I'm like, how are people going to buy this? And then you had Van right, Hammer, right. and it's like, Poor okay, guy. yeah, it's like, okay, you're going to have PN News and Van Hammer together, they're going to be a band, like, what the hell am I watching? Right, exactly, exactly, and, P- and the other guy, Van Hammer, I don't even think he could play the guitar. No, no, it was obvious. No, yeah. He just, yeah, he couldn't play the guitar. So, so I have to ask you this question here. And out of all out of all the questions I have today, and there's not a ton. There's like ten, but um, th- this next one is it has nothing to do with you. So, um, but you were there. You were a part of the show, and that's why I want to ask you this. At okay. at Bastion the Beach in July of 1991. Okay, this pay per view was centered around Ric Flair main eventing against Lex Luger, but the problem was Ric Flair left. He got pissed off, took right. the belt, and went home with Jim Hurd. You were you were a part of the show, and I'm just kind of curious, you know, in this this day and age, or at that time, was there chaos? Like, was it like, oh my god, like the champion oh just my left? Gosh. The fans were chanting, "We want Flair" the whole night, and it was hard to like, you know, you couldn't couldn't get rid of the fan noise because they were chanting, "We want Flair, we want Flair, we want Flair." So yeah, it was pretty much chaos. It was crazy. And then at the Great American Bash, they had the Ric Flair versus Luger, and that never happened. Right. I have the poster, you know, in my in my bedroom. And then my match with the Steiners against Paul Lee and Arn Anderson and Barry Windham didn't take place either because somebody didn't ask the Athletic Commission in Baltimore if a woman, if they could do a mixed tag. Even though all I did was run in and get the pin, I didn't wrestle at all, but the Athletic Commission said no. So they had... Um, Dickie Slater and Dick Murdoch kidnapped me at the beginning of the match and take yeah. me away. Yeah, I recall. Yeah, that whole time that Flair left, it was bad. Every night, the fans were chanting, we want Flair, we want Flair. It it amazes me, right? So, um, you know, I, I wanted to keep this interview mainly wrestling-based and everything, but, okay. you know, I feel like there, there's parts of this that, you know, you have a story, too, that needs to be told, and, and let me explain why before I get to the next question, next series okay. of questions. We, in here in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, we are the biggest advocate of female athletics. We were the first company to cover uh, girls lacrosse, girls high school basketball. Like we're, we're just big supporters of the Me Too movement. All that great stuff, right? And, you know, so I, I have to ask you, there was different things where, you know, today's fan, for example, watches a Becky Lynch and a Charlotte Flair match and a Rhea Ripley, where they go out there and they physically tear down the house. You were in the industry at a very different time where women were kind of shown as really just just bodies, TNA, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, they were considered like midgets. They were considered like, you know, a time where you can go to the 
concession stand and get your <laughs> and get your beer and pretzels or whatever. Yeah, women women's wrestling wasn't considered anything. But my thing was we weren't really doing wrestling. We were doing more cat fights, more like girl fighting. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you something. When we'd get in there, like when I was in UWF or even in war class with with um, sunshine or dark journey those people were on their chairs standing up on their chairs and booing and throwing stuff and getting really into it especially when they were kicking my butt you know people (laughs) really loved it and it was amazing it was amazing i watched some of the old stuff and i look at the crowd and i'm like oh wow they were really really into it you know so you know, and the thing too. Girls can draw. Girl, and I used to say this all the time. If girls have the opportunity, they can draw money, and it proves it right now with Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch and them. Women can draw money. Oh, absolutely, and it's a world of difference again from you know where I grew up. You know, Medusa to me, and it's funny because I literally just had um, uh, Deborah on the show about three weeks ago. She came on to promote her book. And, you know, she was so athletic, right? So giftedly, just oh unbelievably she talented. Was so before her time. I mean, women, the women now should watch some of her stuff because she was so far ahead of her time. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about she was it. amazing. Did you, get any, yeah. did you get any say-so in the creative direction when you guys had, um, it was like a first lady competition at the beach, the Beach oh, Blast yeah. 92. I mean, again, as a you know young teenage hormonal boy, I was loving it. I'm not going to lie. But you know, I look back at it now, I'm like, it was kind of, you know, it's kind of silly. But did you get any kind of like uh, any creative freedom on that to do what you wanted? Oh, heck no. I didn't get anything. They just told us what to do and I did it. That's how it was. The only thing was when they threw me in the water trough on the Clash of the Champions, like I didn't know that was going to happen. Yeah. You know, they did that as a joke. Dusty said later on he did it because Cody was at home watching and he wanted to give Cody something to laugh about. So they <laughs> they were originally, what's funny is, is he also said on the thing they originally were going to throw me into the pen where there was a bowl. Oh, Lord. But the people at the fairground said, you know, it might, you know, steer her or whatever it's called when they use their horns and yeah. they, yeah. you know. Yeah, go after her, and they go, and she could get hurt and die. Well, I guess we're not going to do that. So they decided to throw me in the water trough instead. So, well, and Abdul the butcher picked me up, and he was like, "I'm really sorry," because I didn't know what was going on, you oh know. And then I get dumped in the water trough. So it was kind of funny at the time. I would look at it now and really laugh, but I, at the time I was just like, "What?" <laughs> I hate to say it. Don't be mad at me, but I had to laugh too. Like when I went back. Everybody has. Everybody has. So that's okay. That's it's okay. I'm happy. It's like when <laughs> they, you tried to interview. I think it was. Um, I think I want to say Stan Hansen or something, and yes. he's spitting the tobacco. <laughs> no, I was just looking for an in-room locker room. I think I was looking for maybe Tom uh, Zank. Client Brian or um, yeah, I forget who I was looking for, but I was looking for somebody to do it. It, you know, that was whole off of, there was a lady up in, I think, Boston or somewhere, a real um, an, a reporter, and she was in a men's locker room, and one of the guys took his towel off and put his penis in her face. It's like, is this what you want, or something like that. And there was a whole oop to do about women in the locker rooms, you know, reporters in the locker rooms. And I don't think women reporters should be in the locker room. I think there should be a room where they can go and interview everybody. But, you know, after a match or after, you know, a game or whatever, guys want to do their thing what they do in the locker room. They want to, you know, I hate being in locker rooms now that guys and girls are in it. I kind of get in the corner and sit there and turn my chair because, you know, you got to be respectful. These guys are taking their clothes off and getting dressed and undressed and stuff like that. You want to be respectful to them. But that whole it trying to get an in-room locker room was just done as a parody off that lady. You know, and the thing about it is, it's wild that you say that. This was uh, a couple years ago, really when we first started in 2020. We had Terry Reynolds on the show, and Terry, we had her on as Marlena, but everybody knew um, knew her as Marlena, but regardless. So Terry comes on the show, and she actually talked about when Brock Lesnar, you know, pulled back his towel or whatnot and flashed her, and, you know, it was maybe a 30-second um, conversation and an interview that I think took a good 45 minutes, and wouldn't you know it, that's the thing that blew up, right? And it started such a huge movement and that was again part of the me too movement did you ever have right. a, ever have something like that happen to you where you're like man that shouldn't have happened like this just oh, doesn't sit right let me tell you i've had a lot of stuff happen to me and I, you know i used to chalk it up as that i'm a woman in a man's 
job, you know, in a man's profession and everything, and so I have to take it. But now, I mean, I had one time, um, uh, Ole Anderson, who was the booker at the time, call me up at my house and tell me to come down to the office and give him a blow job. And I just laughed and hung up the phone, you know. But a lot of stuff happened to me that I wish the Me Too movement would have been around, you know, after I got fired in 94. I wish they would have been around because then I would have gotten a lot more money from WCW because <laughs> they screwed me out of my 900 hotline and my calendar and, and all my, you know, my merchandising money. But, um, yeah, I wish they would have been around a lot sooner. But a lot of women took that. A lot of women in the earlier days took a lot of crap from the guys. I mean, I would tell anybody to look into your story, right? Because some of the things you went through I thought were kind of ridiculous. One of which, and again, I, I have two daughters. You know, so I, I take right. this. I take this stuff dead serious. Yeah, so yeah, if you have daughters, you totally get it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a beautiful wife. I'm very blessed. But listen, like you know, from what I read, and, and again, I'm glad you came on the show because a lot of stuff. And this is a podcast, so I could swear a lot of stuff's bullshit. You know. Right. So when you left WCW, rumor has it that there was a picture of you. Uh, you had popped out of your top during a match. You had, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you were exposed, and for you know, some moron decided it was a good idea. To take, capture that picture and put it on the wall at, I believe, CNN. This is something you, you told Eric Bischoff yeah, about, and he refused. Yeah. So what happened? Yeah. Well, I, we went in there. I was up there to take promo pictures with the Nasty Boys, and I see it hanging on the wall. It was in the photography studio, and I guess it was the photographer that took it, you know, out at ringside. And um, I pulled it off the wall. I crumpled it up and threw it in the trash can. And then I went back to the trash can and got it and pulled it out and said, you know what? I need this. And so, and I took it to Bishop, and I said, listen, I want an apology, and I want to know if there's any other copies out there. I want this taken down. This is ridiculous. And he didn't do anything about it. He didn't do anything about it. I had no apology, nothing. That's ridiculous. I I don't have any other words. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it was was low class. Very low class. Okay. Yeah, now they can go on the internet and see my boobs all day long. There's like a million naked pictures of me on the internet. But at the time. You know, I didn't, I didn't consent to that being up there. It, you know? it has to be your consent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I try, I completely understand that. You know. Um. So I have a question here. You know, as as we get towards the end of these, and I, I appreciate you taking a few moments sure. for us today. But this one's kind of a deep thinker. So I hope okay. I hope I explain it correctly. All right. Okay. So. We talked about it a little bit ago with Charlotte and Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch and you know so on down the line. Women's wrestling today is tremendous. I mean, it's it's unbelievably good. Do you think in the early '90s um, they had like women wrestling had the talent to do that, or is it just a matter of today's athlete being better? And that just let me let me just stress this real quick, like because we we cover a ton of high school sports. All right, I've noticed quite frankly that the best athletes are going off for sports. They're no longer doing, like, gymnastics or cheerleading. Like, it's legit, like, they go from that to oh, gymnastics collegiate. gymnastics and cheerleading is real sports. Yeah, but I, I guess mean, that's not what I'm saying. You to do that. Oh, I know what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, but I mean, so d- does the question make any sense at all? Like, basically, like, yeah. well, where, I yeah, mean, I where is it there? Mean- I don't think that they were ready for it. I think it evolves with the time, and it's just evolved. Wrestling's changed a lot. You know, the high flying, the moves, you know, wrestling's changed a lot. I mean, I went to a WWE show here in Tallahassee a couple months back with my girlfriend. Paul Lee, as a matter of fact, got me tickets, and we were sitting second row ringside, which was awesome. But the, one of the girls' matches, to me, it looked like, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. I mean this in a really great way. It looked like dancing with the stars in gymnastics. Yep. I mean, these two girls were awesome. They were doing flips. They were doing all kinds of moves. And um, I'm thinking about getting back in the ring myself to do some mixed tags and do some other stuff. And um, I even bought me a new pair of boots and some other, you know, getting ready to do it. And um, I talked to my doctor, and my doctor, you know, he watches us. He's like, "Don't be doing any of that stuff." But I see, you know, he's like, like, "No, no, I'm going to be working against my guy. He's going to take care of me, and it'll be okay." He's like, "No, no, no, you'll be in here like with all kinds of problems." You know, he's like, "Don't you be doing that," you know, because wrestling evolved and changed so much, and just the athletic, athleticity, athletic. Because of it, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. But anyway, it has changed so much. I mean, the guys have had to up their game. 
amazingly. There's no more going in there and grabbing a headlock. No. You know? No. No more of that. I mean, you've got to be an outstanding athlete to do what they do. It's totally amazing. Do you have any interest in coming back, other than wrestling, like a behind the scenes, um, creative oh, direction? I'd love to. I mean, I'm, you know, a lot of people say, you know, they always think you're a dumb blonde. I'm like, it takes a smart brunette to play a dumb blonde. But I, I would love to work with people on their interviews, you know, work behind the scenes as not as an agent per se, but I could do an agent's role. But I would love to help them with their interviews and, and, and teach them to work with the camera and things like that. I would love to do that, but no one's ever given me the opportunity. I mean, I've never tried for it. I don't even know if they have anything like that, but yeah, I would love to do something like that. Help them with their, with their character. Well, you know, the thing about it is, is, and, 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 you know, let me just put this out here, guys. You know, it's not that um, I think people are old, so it's not like I'm saying they need to listen to like their uh, elders or anything like that. But you know, there's there's a lot of wisdom there that goes uncaptured. My grandfather, who's a hell of a lot older than you, so don't worry, I'm not comparing you to my grandfather. But my grandfather, you know, died at night. You know, he was 90 years old when he died last year, and he was sharp as a tack. There's a lot of times people who have lived it and been a part of it for years, no matter what the sport is or, or, or what it even is. It could be painting a fence. I don't care. But you want to go to the people who know how to do it. And not only that, drew money doing it and knew what they, they were successful. Right. I mean, just wisdom there alone. I mean, I've been around wrestling since I was 17, been in it since I was 21. You know, I did learn. I lived with Jake Roberts, who's a great mind and a great booker. We used to sit up all night talking about angles and talking about stuff. And then Eddie Gilbert, you know, he was a really smart guy when it came to wrestling and booking. So I've, a little bit of it did rub off on me. So I do have a little bit of something, something in me, you know. And and I love, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I love wrestling. And I, and I talk about old stuff when I watch old tapes and the new stuff. I love Game Changer. Game Changer rocks. I mean, these guys are really great. And New Japan and everybody. I just, you know, I love the product. I love wrestling. I have for many, many years. I'm going off the script one more time with this question. It wasn't written, okay. wasn't written down, but do you think AEW can compete for a long time and, and remain a force? Yes, definitely, definitely. I think they have a lot of people on the roster that it's a lot of talent that they don't use. They have, what, 200-something people? Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's like they need to use some of them. I mean, they got so many shows during the week, it seems like they could use their talent that they got. You know, like Rachel Riveter, she's awesome. And um, I just worked with her last week yet against um, 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 uh, Zamaya. And I managed Zamaya against her. And she's really awesome. I mean, these girls are talented. So we have three questions left for you. And these were the, th- okay. these were the three submitted by the fans. So okay. two of them are actually pretty serious. One of them, I guess I'll start with the one that kind of makes me scratch my head. Um, okay. <laughs> so somebody wants to know, uh, do you subscribe to the WWE network? Um, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> and moving on to the next question. Yeah. Um, everybody do this. Do me a favor. Google my name in there. So it comes up that people are wanting to know. Cause I'm all over the WWE network. Yes, you all are. my stuff from, you know, WCW and Memphis and everywhere is on there. You were a staple of Clash of the Champions. I swear to God, there was like 10 episodes in a row where you were like either the host or like you had some form of something with Clash of the Champions. So, yeah, oh, check that out. Doing that. that was so much fun doing live TV. Um, okay, two more questions here from the fans, and then we're all done for okay. the day. This one is a little bit, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm not real comfortable asking this, but... Um, they want to know if the story of Paul Varlins is true or if that's an urban legend. It's true. It's true. Yes, he wouldn't. He didn't want to tap out the Taz, so I kind of promised him a date if he would tap out the Taz. And then after he did, I was like, "Nah, I don't. I don't sleep with your bronies." <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, Lord, God rest his soul. He put me up to it. This was all Paul Lee's idea. It was not my idea. It was all Paul Lee. Yeah, well, I'm glad I didn't read the question word for word because it 
It was asking yeah. if you promised them oral sex, and I'm not comfortable asking that. So yeah, no, it wasn't oral sex, but okay. I'm moving on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's not my question. Um, yeah, I don't even. It makes me sweat. I even have to ask that something that stupid. Anyways, <laughs> uh, the, the final question though is actually I think a, a pretty damn good one here. Um, it says, "Do you feel with what you gave to the world of professional wrestling?" that the WWE should and will induct you into their Hall of Fame, despite the fact that you never worked for them for any long stretch of time? Well, they put a lot of people in there that haven't worked for them. You know, there's a lot of people in there that haven't worked for them. I mean, Snoop Dogg hasn't worked for them. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of people that haven't worked for them. But I'm hoping they will one day. I don't know when it'll happen, but that's a dream of mine, to get that ring, you know, the WWE ring. So, and maybe I, one day they will. I think, you know, it, it's it's impact-wise, right? Like, you know, with Sonny, a lot of people had a problem with, with Sonny, or, you know, Tammy Sitch, who never actually wrestled the match, going to the Hall of Fame. But I actually thought I was like, hey, this woman was a trailblazer in her own right. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, she started all the divas. Yeah. So the camera loves her. She's a beautiful girl, too. Or she was, or is. I mean, she still is. But, I mean, you know, the camera loved her. She's so talented. She could talk. I mean, one of the best managers out there. Oh, 100% agreed. Well, yeah. listen, I wanted to thank you for coming on the show again today. You know, well, anytime. Thank we, you for having me. Yeah, but you mentioned your Twitter a couple times. You mentioned your Instagram. I want you to plug that. Where can fans oh, yeah, follow and support you? Do, you? do you put up a logo, or how do you do that? No, I'll put up the actual link for everybody. Okay, put up a link, send it to me, um, um, Text it to me, and I'll make sure it's on Twitter and Instagram. No, no, no. What I'm saying, I'll, I'll definitely do that. But what I'm saying is, how do people follow and support you? Oh, oh I'm on, <laughs> I'm on Twitter, Missy Hyatt on Twitter, and um, Instagram, the real Missy Hyatt. Well, this was a blast. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of myself, the show, uh, the fans, thank you, and we'll send you everything when it's all uh, edited out and, and done and ready to go. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, take care and God bless. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. So that was Missy Hyatt there, uh, just absolutely tremendous. Want to go ahead and you know thank her again for her dedication to the business and everything she did to make it better. And I say that very clearly because a lot of times, um, you know, kind of as she said too, right? Unless you go on that WWE network, sometimes in current wrestling, you know, they bury the past, right? You don't really hear all the names. You hear the uh, you hear about Trish and Lita over and over and over again. But for the most part, there was a lot of female wrestlers, um, you know, I'll say late '80s, early '90s, that don't nearly get the credit they deserve today. So, just wanted to get that out there. Wanted to thank everybody again. Hope everybody is enjoying their Memorial Day weekend. We'll talk to you again soon. This was Vince McKee, Keon Sports, with the Wrestling New Legends podcast.